I'm Sage. Hey, we're the Will Heights. Hi, I'm Jesse. Hi, I'm Amanda Hodges. Hi, I'm Delia. Hi, we're the Nicholsons. Welcome to Foundry. Welcome to Foundry. Welcome to Foundry. And welcome, and welcome to Foundry. To Foundry. Welcome to Foundry. Welcome to Foundry. Welcome to Foundry. <laughs> welcome to Foundry. Hey friends, I'm Chad. I'm the pastor of Foundry. I hope you're having a fantastic Easter weekend so far. And I thank you so much for tuning in and worshiping with Foundry this Easter Sunday. If this is your first time here, you've honored us with your presence. We'd love for you to fill out a digital connection card. We're dropping that down in the comment bar right now. We invite everyone to check in here on Facebook. We do that every single Sunday. We do it for a lot of different reasons, but all I can tell you is that your check-in is helping people in need right now through our relationship with an organization called Reach. But we're here today because Jesus is big enough. In fact, this is the day where Jesus became absolutely big enough. The day that we celebrate his defeat over death, his resurrection, and how that act brought us back into a relationship with the Father, the creator of all things. And so thank you so much for tuning in. We're about to get going in worship. It's going to be a fantastic time together. Uh, and so let's just start off with prayer like we always do every single Sunday when we're together. Holy Father, we are here knowing that you have been here long before we were. God, and we come to you with expectant and full hearts right now, seeking to engage you with all of our being. God, meet us right where we are at right now. You know what we need, and we know that you can provide for us. So thank you so much. And you know me pray. Amen. Let's worship together. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my soul Till I met you I was breathing but not Alive. All my failures I try to hide It was my soul Till I knew You called my name And I ran out of that grave darkness into your glorious day you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day
fullness of the eternal promise stirring in your sons and daughters earth revealing heaven's wonders spirit come spirit come what you spoke is now And your children shall be holded And dreams awaken in this moment Spirit come, Spirit come Pour it out, let your love run power is within us we will rise to be your witness the spirit come the spirit come pour it out let your love run over here and now let your glory Run.
So I'm standing here in the Sterlington area food pantry and foundry. You know, we bring canned chicken on the first of every month, but I want to just kind of pop in and show you a little bit of this place because this is one of the things that God has called us to in our communities to support uh, this ministry. Uh, and as we are just preparing for what might be several weeks or what might be a couple of more months, we know that the ministry that happens here is important. It's important for a couple of different reasons. One, it's important for us. You know, we talk about the four Jesus assumptions. And one of those assumptions is that what Jesus invites us into, the fulfillment he invites us to uh, through cooperating alongside of him and his ministry is the best thing that we can find. And these are one that this is places something that we prayed for, um, praying for God to give us clarity of what he's called us to do, of the places he's called us to be. And this is one of them. And you support this routinely. And so what I ask of you right now is just to keep on supporting the food pantry. If you've got a donation you want to give towards or you have some food you want to give towards it, let us know. Uh, you, we, we want to uh, facilitate that. But also this is here to serve people in this community that are in need. There might be people watching this who, who need the food pantry. If that's the case, we'd love for you to contact us and let us know about that. But most of all, this is another place that we can encounter Christ and we can encounter Christ here in a variety of ways. But this is what happens when we simply open ourselves up and make ourselves available to the presence of Christ. And so uh, when I say that the local church can respond faster than anyone else and anything else, the local church is able to do things like this in relational ways and ways that honor real life, another one of our core values here at Foundry, but also allow us to be with the presence of Christ, in the presence of Christ, and with each other working towards the redemption of our community. Community. And so in just a few moments, uh, you can give, and I'm going to throw an image on the screen here uh, that shows the different ways that you can give digitally to Foundry. We invite you to participate in one of those ways, but more so, we invite you to discover what faithfulness looks like and to discover what does it mean to respond to the presence of Christ here in our community, but also here in your hearts. Thank you so much. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on, the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. I think we can all say that Easter feels a little different. It's all right to say. I know that this one uh, feels really different for me. And then there's usually this huge amount of stress and this trying to get the word out about worship and marketing and promo and just all this stuff for Easter. It's a whole big thing. And I'm not even going to talk to you about my Easter curse. We don't have time to talk about the Easter curse. Uh, <laughs> But it's not the Easter we expected, but I think it's the Easter that we need. I remember when I was coming home, we heard about the governor's orders uh, just a few weeks ago saying, you know what, we'll, this will be over by Easter. We'll be able to have Easter. That was a thought in my head. And I was with my dad, who's a pastor at the time, and that was a thought that was in uh, his head as well. Uh, but that's not the case. We're coming out of this culture of unlimited wants 
and near unlimited access. I remember a time when I thought it was a drag that my Amazon package took three days to get to me. And now I'm waiting for stuff that's like six weeks out, stuff I've never expected to have a shortage of or to not be able to find as a normal part of life by now. Like I said earlier, we're coming out of a place of unlimited wants. And many of us are facing for the first time in life what needs actually are. But as I'm saying this, you might be saying, Chad, you're talking about a world with less. That's not a very good Easter message. What's going on here? And that's where our mind is taking us. But what if our wants and our expectations are simply inadequate? And that's why God has to redefine them. That's why we need to understand resurrection. Now, have we ever thought about that? And the really funny thing is this happens in Scripture time and time again where we get to the place where we show up with our expectations and things begin to change. People uh, show up thinking they understand what's going on and they leave with this realization that they are in a space not previously occupied. Now, typically they show up asking for proof and they end up leaving with greater faith. And I'll give you a hint. I'll give you a little bit of a, this is how the sausage is made type thing. Preachers never preach this Mark passage for Easter because it's weird. It's kind of funny. It ends abruptly. We, we like the John passage because the language is beautiful and it's just, I mean, there's just it, you're, you're set up for a home run automatically. Or we like the Matthew passage because the language is familiar. All of those things. You don't preach the Mark passage at Easter. But as I was preparing a couple of weeks ago and I realized that, that Easter was going to be different, the, I realized that the Mark passage is the perfect passage for us because it's not about what we expect, but it's about what we need. We get this different version of the Easter story. That, that because it causes us to process our own experiences and personal expectations of the resurrection. So let's get started today. So let's talk about this story for just a few moments. Early in the morning, uh, Jesus' most devoted followers made the journey outside of the city walls to the tomb that Jesus was given two days before. You know, Jewish people measure days beginning at nightfall. Jesus was crucified and died on a Friday afternoon, was taken down and buried before the Sabbath, day one. Uh, the second day was Friday evening to Saturday evening. We call that Holy Saturday, day two. But early Sunday morning on day three, these devoted followers, and not the twelve or the eleven disciples we might be expecting, but these three women who had been impacted by his ministry, stood by him at the cross, consoling his mother, watching him being buried, came early to prepare his body because everything had been rushed on Friday. And, and let's talk about this preparing his body thing. This isn't embalming. Uh, and also, let me ask you this question. Who do you love enough to unseal their tomb three days after they were buried? Uh, you know, this whole exercise that they're coming to do is about washing the body and about controlling the smell. Now, I think back to the time I've been around dead things, and it's never pretty. I think about the times I've been around rotten things, and, and it's never pretty. They came to unwrap Jesus from his burial cloths, to wash his body, to anoint him in fragrant oils, and to rewrap, uh, rewrap his body uh, while leaving fragrant herbs inside of the layers. You know, this, this isn't pretty work. And I repeat, who do you love enough to dig up after three days and get hands on with? Now, let's, let's be honest. This speaks to a level of dedication that is beyond most of us. And the biggest worry they had on, on their minds that morning was finding a way to move this stone. They didn't totally recognize the situation that they were stepping into. This wasn't the morning that they were expecting, but it was the morning that they needed. And what happens uh, with them that morning is an angelic, an, 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 is an angelic encounter. Uh, you know, in fact, uh, you know, they, we see fear, we see fright, 
But these are typical emotions for when a person runs into an angel. In fact, they pretty much mirror every other situation. In Luke 1, we read this. When Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. And again with Mary, the mother of Jesus, where it says this in Luke chapter 2, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth to a village in Galilee, a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. And Gabriel appeared to her and said, greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You know, the appearance of this angel to these three women coming to watch Jesus is consistent with nearly every other encounter in Scripture when an angel meets people. But this encounter is the one that changes everything. Angelic encounters have always been a marker to call someone to open their eyes and to realize a new way of life. And if the resurrected Jesus isn't a new way of life, I don't know what is. But there's two things I want for us to live into this morning from the story. Two ways that we are getting the Easter we need rather than the Easter we were expecting. And the first one of these things is this. How do we handle things when our world gets remade? You know, what this angel is telling these women, you know, everything about the way that you used to view things is now different because he isn't here. He's risen. And this is bigger than what you were expecting. You see, these women came here to do a physical action and the angel responded and engaged with them in the physical realm. He said, he isn't here. Look, this is where you placed him just three days ago and he isn't here. Scripture says that they were trembling. They were filled with awe and wonder. Again, part of this this pattern of angelic encounters. But they were so filled with the presence of God in this moment that they found themselves physically moved. They're still in the realm of the physical. But it also says they were astonished. And for us, this seems like a normal thing. Like, oh, if I have this encounter in my life, I'm going to be astonished as well. Uh, But this... This is bigger because this is saying that they were inside of this visionary experience, that they were in our world, but in the middle of this thin space which the reality of the eternal plan of God was given to them for the first time, that their minds became displaced while they were physically still grounded in the present. You know, when our world gets remade, it does feel like an out-of-body experience. Our mind does weird things. We're scrambling right now for anchor points, just as they were scrambling for anchor points. But we're also trying to mentally reshape what our boundaries are. Now think of this. How many times have you used or you heard the phrase, our new normal, over the last few weeks? And regardless of what's going on, we always find our physical grounding in the world that God gives us. You know, He won't pull us out of this. You know, we don't expect it when God decides to remake everything around us, but we always need it. The second thing that shows up in this story that I want us to think about this morning is this, is that when things are no longer the same, it's hard to anticipate your next move. I've heard many people say, that you know, things are redefined every single morning now, that we know we, we get the new rule book every morning when we wake up. And I think this speaks to this story, this speaks to this situation. But if we go back to that whole astonishment thing that these women had going on, um, and, and it's perhaps the reason this gospel ends so abruptly, but Jesus is in the business of astonishment, of pulling people out of these weird out-of-body experiences but still grounded on earth in a new vision of reality. Uh, this is what he does, and we find it other places in the Gospels. In Mark chapter 5, 42, it says this, And immediately the girl got up and began to walk. Uh, at this moment, they were overcome with amazement. In the Gospel of Luke, we read this, Amazement seized all of them, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen strange things today. You know, friends, when the old rules don't apply, 
we realize that Jesus is offering us a new invitation to a new way of doing things, a new way full of possibilities not previously available. You know, we can't expect things we don't know about. But we're living in a space right now that has not been previously occupied. Jesus tells uh, the women, uh, the, the angel tells the women to tell the rest of the disciples that he will meet them in Galilee. This has been their home base for three years. Uh, this is where they are used to his ministry. This is the place where they met Jesus. This is the place where they experienced Jesus. This was the place where some of them were healed by Jesus. And this is where they came back to time and time again. Because here's the thing, even when Jesus calls us to this new world, He always calls us in our context. You've heard me say this before, but Jesus speaks to us in ways that we can understand, that He's honoring the whole depth of our whole experiencing. And, and this, this coming to us in our context is almost a way that He is relieving a pressure release valve. It's like, I know that you're anxious. I know that you're stressed inside of this. But let me still ground you in what you know me to be in the ways that you can understand this. So this isn't what they were expecting. But Jesus knew what they needed. So friends, this Easter morning, let's put this into our story. And this story and the story of the world that is unfolding around us right now, that this is the Easter story of the COVID crisis and the revealing of the resurrection of the Lord to the church. That while we are consumed with death, the crucified dead one is consumed with life. And our call is to live into this confidence with our faith and with our experience. We are called to let our lives be altered, to meet Jesus in this middle space with Him, into a new experience that transforms the ways that we see the world and the boundaries that this gives us. For us to not try to live in this old world because it simply isn't adequate enough anymore. It's not adequate physically, it's not adequate mentally, and it's not adequate spiritually for us. It's not adequate enough for us to personally experience the resurrection of Jesus. Okay. So I want to just finish telling you this story, and it's the story that... I did not realize how intense it was at the time, but now has just been replaying through my mind this last week. And it's a story of something just a few weeks ago. Um, and I, f I feel like every single week I talk about something that I experienced a month ago when I was in the Holy Land. But I feel like, it, you know, today this story is just, just important. And, um, you know, when we got, we were nervous that we wouldn't be able to, to even get into Jerusalem because of the Corona crisis and people just like closing things down. And when we got there, I was like, I've got one thing I want to do. I've just got one thing I want to do. I want to go to the Holy Sepulcher. I want to go to this place the church has said for thousands of years uh, is, the, is the tomb of Christ. And they've revered. And it's this big, huge, ornate, kind of gaudy looking church now. But I wanted to go no matter what. We had a couple, I told you a story about an experience the other night, uh, a couple weeks ago in a sermon. But one afternoon, Meredith and I and my mom, we kind of uh, got away from the tour group and we had something we had to take care of. And we sat there and we, we drank a cup of coffee. Um, and, and we end up that afternoon saying, you know, on the way home, like, you know, if we pass by the sepulcher, let's see what the line is like. Because typically the line to get into the tomb of Christ, you'll sit in it for hours. And so we walked by and because people, tours were already starting to get out and to leave, um, the line was only like 20 people deep. And just this, this, this experience that we had going into the tomb of Christ for a moment, this was huge. But that's not the big thing. The thing is, is I became obsessed with this site. And every time we would come close to it, I'd want to steal away from the group just to go see the building, to go walk inside of there real quick. I swear I can still smell it right now. But the very last morning that we were in Jerusalem, I was like, you know, we, we were going to leave at 11. I got up at 5, and I, was like, the, the, I knew this church opened at 4 a.m. And I was like, I'm going to go one last time and see, can I get into the tomb of Christ one last time? And so... I put my backpack on and I just kind of started just almost running to try to see how quick I can get there. And I get into the old city of Jerusalem and, you know, the old city is different than what you expect. Like um, it's a lot less cheesy Christian movie and a lot more homeland. 
But what I thought about was this passage from Philippians uh, that I had been just ruminating over my head for the last couple of days. And I found myself as I'm kind of going through these really narrow alleys and it's still dark, just repeating this passage over and over in my head. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And it became my prayer with almost every single step I took. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. I want to read this whole passage for you briefly. And this is what it says from chapter 3 of Philippians. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I now consider them to be garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of His resurrection, and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. Not that I have obtained all these things, or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And that phrase, that, that, that verse just has been ruminating over and over. And that morning as I was just kind of rushing to see if I could be one of the first ones in there to just get a taste of that empty tomb, you know, I began to realize that this is about the power that was released to us on this morning. And friends, earlier in the message I shared with you that this is not the typical Easter passage, but this is the passage that we need for now. And friends, what we need more than anything else is to know and to live in the power of this resurrection. Not the sentimentality of this resurrection, not the good feeling of this resurrection, but our world needs the church to step into this new way of existence that Christ gave us fully and completely that day. For us to make our prayer, I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection that we want to know Him and everything that He truly released for us on that morning. Friends, this is the Easter we need. It's not the one that we expect, but it's the one that we need because this is the Easter that the world needs. This place in time That I might seek and find my God My God Cause Lord I want to yearn for you I want to burn with passion over you And all Your joy is mine And why 